why the majority of military leadership, especially now, is so f***ed up is that it, it rewards yes men and people who are focused on checking all of the right boxes career-wise. So it's a combination of, of having a because then the reason why I like this to start with the House of Representatives, again, on top of or dovetailing on to the point of it's, it's a good pulse for the country, but everything has to go through them. You know, the, the Supreme Court, well, they have to move through there. So mm -hmm. if, if you, the, but the problem is, is that right now it's not really an accurate, accurate representation of the country. So if you can clean house there and actually have a, a legitimate, this is how the country feels, every justice that gets voted on is going to be by people who you want voting on, who, on whether or not that guy or girl should get put in. Uh, you know, whether it's vetoing bills that the president tries to, tries to do or, or that gets generated up by the House of Representatives, you, you have a much better chance at least for um, an accountability piece within that, that part of the government. And because they're the biggest check and balance on every other power within the United States government, I think that's our best shot. I feel like I got to put a rap beat underneath this. My man's spitting today. You, I you wish were you ready would. to roll. This was good. I'm always ready to roll. But... I like that idea a yeah. lot. I like that House of Representatives idea a lot. And I agree with you. They're essentially the first line of defense, and we yeah. don't think of it that way. Yeah. But they're the ones that are supposed to actually represent the population, meaning, you know, Rhode Island has many fewer reps than California does because there's more people in California. So it actually does speak to the local populaces. Yeah. But, you know, we talk about lobbying money and taking that out. And I unfortunately agree with you. It's like you're cynically not going to be able to do things like this. My my friend Andy Bustamante, who is a former CIA spy, if there's such thing as a yeah. former. I, I doubt he's former. But when he was first allegedly coming out of the CIA, he was getting like his master's or something down in Florida. And the local U.S. congressman came in to – speak with them and about something. And so at the end, she said, can you guys let me know as constituents anything you want me to take to Congress to vote on? And he goes, I'd like you to impose term limits. Can you take that to vote? <laughs> and she's like, I I'm not going to do that. And he's like, but I'm your constituent. I just yeah. told you to do that. What does everyone else think? They're like, yeah. yeah. They're like, we're telling you. They're incentivized not to do it, though, because yeah. they, they like the cushiness of it. They get to have their nice steak dinners on K Street, feel important because people pay them, and yeah. that's just how it is. I mean, asking them to do that is like asking the the fox to audit himself in the hen house. Like, the shit's <laughs> not happening, you know? So, uh, it's and it's never going to happen, you know? So, uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, of course they're not going to do it. The same reason they're never going to disallow themselves from being able to invest in companies that they own and decide where, you know, government contracts go to and, and what have you, that, that should be disbanded illegal and, and you know, bribing, i.e. lobbying should be illegal and, and not, not uh, part of the process too. Yeah, because other countries around the world take advantage of that process, obviously, too, with oh, their own sure. interests. For you sure. know, and like I understand, like right now, obviously Israel is a small country in the Middle East. They're surrounded by a lot of countries that don't like them. It's a much smaller population, ethnicity wise, compared to the I guess like Jews versus Arabs. But like they're using that system to get our favor because they have things like APAC, which pays all these congressmen and these senators to then vote for aid, by the way, in the middle of those same bills you talk about where they're voting on something else and then they throw in, oh, yeah, 13 billion here. And I get it. They're trying to protect themselves, but we have our system set up in a way that they're literally able to do that. And then our taxpayer money just continues to go to fund bombs in Gaza. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and it's. I mean, to me, the, the sick, twisted irony of it is that we're essentially on both sides of it. You know, it's like we're sending money to both sides and, <laughs> and you know, paying for, for two groups to fight each other. You uh, never heard of hedging your bets? Come on. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it happens <laughs> nonstop. But I, I mean, to me, that's the problem. I mean, as an 18-year-old joining the military, myself included, I think most, most of us assume that our elected officials have our best interest in mind and that they're only going to send us places that – check those boxes of, you know, this is a, an existential threat and it's a requirement and, and we need to do it. That's just not the fucking reality, you know, and uh, the older I get, the more I realize that. And even within the, the military, you know, as I spent more and more time, you get to, to higher up positions leadership wise, you start to see peaks behind the curtain and see how things really work and, and who answers to who. And, and it's, uh, it's pretty disheartening, you know, so 
yeah, I mean, there, there needs to be a, a significant change in, in a lot of things. But. It, would you mind giving, if you don't want to, no problem, but would yeah. you mind giving some specifics on that, like some things you've seen without naming names yeah. or positions? Um, I mean, to me, the, the biggest thing is is the, you know, I don't make the rules. Like, okay, well, who does? Yeah. Like, well, it's my boss. Then fucking ask him why we're doing this. Well, no, you know, it's just like the higher up you go, and I will say that that's its own problem. The The biggest problem from a kind of boots on the ground standpoint in terms of why the why the majority of military leadership, especially now, is so fucked up is that it it rewards yes men and people who are focused on checking all of the right boxes career-wise. So it's a combination of, of having a, a poor setup for promotion in terms of it doesn't really reflect who, who the good professional soldiers are. It reflects who the fucking dorks are that know how to game the system and, and check every fucking leadership box. And I did that school and I did this billet and I did this fucking thing, you know, and, and they line all that up and they blow whoever their superior is to get a good fit rep or eval or whatever. And, uh, and so you've got these guys who the fucking dudes don't like who are, are, you know, basically fucking spineless in terms of war fighters who, who are just administrative geeks that know, that know and understand how to, how to line all of these things up to make themselves look good and get promoted. The type of guys who, who don't give a shit about that, who they care about the guys that they're leading, who care about being in the best shape, being the best shot, being the, the, the most Viking like pipe hitter to go overseas and do the job and, and, and lead men in, in a fashion with which they need to be led so that we all come home, those guys aren't focusing on any of that. So they get shafted and and either in trouble or they get stifled promotion-wise and to the point where they're just like, fuck this, I'm going to go start my own business. I'm going to go do something else. So the higher up you get, the more you have this yes man, career politician, yeah, guy politics. that's bucking prom for promotion and doing all of the things that he's doing solely focused on getting promoted, not on being the best prof professional soldier he is. So, you know, that, that, that process year after year after year is, is just going to continue to, to water down leadership and, and corrupt it. When you, when you then couple that with administrations, like when Obama came in and, you know, I'm not saying everything he did was wrong. He did some, actually some great things for the military in terms of allowing us to do certain things and, and, loosening the leash in some respects that even Bush had uh, had on us. Um, but what where I think he really, really took a big misstep was was the cultural uh, ramming of, of experimentation and, and social issues into the military with, mm. um, you know, all of the different kind of, you know, sexual orientation and trans types type things. And uh, I would say shoving the, the political correctness component even further down the military's throat. And you know, to me, one of the beauties of the military is that unlike most things, and I would say un unlike almost everything else, is that you're not looking at things from a bottom line standpoint, from a budget standpoint. I mean, yes, we have budgets, but they can be adjusted if they're clearly defined and, and you can, you know, give a, a justification as to why they're changing. But you can really reduce it down to one simple question, which is it, whatever the question is that you're asking, does that make us a better war fighting force? Yes, mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. Does it not? No, don't do it. Waste of time. So, you know, it's, well, again, it's like I, I can't think of anything else that you really have that luxury to, to be able to, to make it so simple in terms of your decision-making process. But the U.S. military is that. And, and, but we've, we've uh, ruined that by, you know, doing all of these things that don't make us better warfighters but appease certain uh, glimpses or, or channels of, of our – of our society. And, and, and I would even say, you know, these, these loud minorities that, that tend to, yeah. you know, kick and scream and, and throw, throw enough of a tantrum to get people to change their behavior in the military just isn't the place for that. The saddest part about it too, is that even before this stuff started, not only does the military have men and women, right. But it's also like extremely diverse. Yeah. There's people from all different backgrounds in the yeah. military, all kinds of minority communities and stuff. Like it was, it's like, you could even give the argument like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Like, what are we doing here? And I totally agree. Like when we're worried about, let's just call it what it is, virtue signaling over people that are supposed to be job occupation warriors. Like yeah, it's, what's the DEI? What are we doing? Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's stupid. And, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, to your point of, of it's already very diverse. And, and to me, that's one of the beauties of the military. You know, I've heard people say, trying to justify it within the confines of, of military leadership, especially at, at the higher echelons, uh, you know, at the Pentagon and Joint Chiefs level of, of leadership and uh, saying, you know, diversity is our strength. It's not, you know, the, the fact that we can unify out of a very right. diverse group of people is what our strength is. Focusing on the diversity is, is not what makes us strong. It's, it's the fact that you can take people from every fucking walk of life out there and turn them into. Thank you for watching the video, guys. If you haven't already subscribed, please smash that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.